I like, I think everybody else in the world feels like I grew up in a simpler time. And it was, um, it was a more innocent time. The explosion of the internet hadn't happened yet. And we would have fun that today you would get shot for. One night, one night we were at Aaron's house. His parents were asleep. We decided it was time to go on a mission. We were going to go down to Aaron, female version Aaron's house, and ring her doorbell. It was 12.30 in the morning. We were going to wake up the whole family and we were going to run. It was going to be hilarious. <laughs> so we snuck out. We tiptoed down the street. We stayed close to bushes. We made the voyage down to female Aaron's house. We did an army crawl on the driveway, which really hurts when you crawl on cement. <laughs> but we were young and dumb. It didn't matter. We got up on the porch. We started fighting over who was going to actually ring the doorbell. So we decided we would all just take turns ringing the doorbell, which made the getaway go a little bit slower. But it was 1230 in the morning, and people weren't expecting to have their doorbell rung. And this was way before the advent of ring doorbell, where you can get video sent to your phone and then record exactly what punks rang your doorbell at 1230 in the morning. And so we just kept ringing that doorbell until we saw a light flip on, and then we just booked it. We ran a couple houses down. We hid in the bushes. We watched as they came to the front door, and they looked out all bewildered, and we laughed. <laughs> that was great. We gave each other high fives. They closed their door. Like, should we go do it again? No, no, that's, that's pushing our luck. So we started, we started the path back to Aaron's house where we were staying the night, male Aaron's. We said, what about that house? He's like, you don't, you don't want to do that house. Like, Why? He's like, dude, that's the creepy house in the neighborhood. Every neighborhood has the creepy house. You know exactly what I'm talking about. The house where you're like, either you've never seen the people who live there, and you're not entirely sure somebody does live there, but packages just disappear. So either there's a serial thief in the neighborhood, or else somebody actually does live in the house, but you never see lights on, you never see cars leak. You don't know what's going on in that place, but there's somebody there. It, you either have one of those, or you have the house, you're like, yeah, I'm pretty sure everybody who lived there died five years ago, but the grass keeps getting cut somehow, and I'm not really sure what's going on. Every, everybody knows those houses. He's like, dude, that's the crazy house. You, we, we don't want to go. We're like, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. He's like, all right, let's do it. And so we this time did an army crawl, but we walked up to the doorbell. It's like, you wearing it? No. Gone was the enthusiasm because now this was the crazy house. Somebody's finally like, all right, I'll, I'll ring it. I'll ring the doorbell. Rings the doorbell lights shoot on immediately and we just look at each other and we're like gotta go and we just start running guy comes downstairs flings open the door he had to have been at the service at some point in time because this is 12 35 in the morning and he leaves his house and starts running outside and we're like ah and we start just booking it and we're like, let's go to the, we can't go to Aaron's house. This dude will know where we're going. We got to go hide. We got to split up. We'll meet back there in five minutes. We never turned around to see if he like was just messing with us, how far he went off his property, if he watched everything go down at Aaron's house and knew what was about. To, we, we don't know any of that because none of us were going to find out. But we waited the five minutes and it felt like an eternity. And then we got back to Aaron's house and we were quieter in that house than we had ever been before in our lives. And we got like the one ring of mini blinds propped up at the very corner of the window trying to see if this man is coming to Aaron's house to either assault us or murder us in our sleep. Like, none of us slept that night. We were freaking out. What was going to happen? Because we rang his doorbell. We were scared. We didn't know what was going to happen. Nothing happened. It was fine. We eventually were just exhausted and fell asleep sometime around 4 a.m., 
got up at 7 a.m. and then relived our glory around the breakfast table when his parents were out of the room so they didn't know what all had gone down. And we talked about how awesome the night before was. But in those moments of fear, it felt like forever. And oftentimes when we experience fear, we become paralyzed. We become stuck. We isolate ourselves. We lock out everything else around us. And I want you to know you're not alone. This morning we're going to look back and we're going to see some of Jesus' friends and followers, his disciples, and what has taken place just hours after Jesus rose from the dead. And so you can follow along on your phones or on your tablets. We're going to be looking at the book of John today, and we're going to start in John 20, verse 19, where we read these words. On the evening of that day, the day that Jesus rose from the dead, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews. Jesus has risen from the dead. Jesus is alive. Here are his followers. Here are his disciples. And they're in a house. And they're hiding out. And the doors the house are locked because they are stuck. They are paralyzed. They are fearful. Fear has kept them locked up. And that's one of the things that fear does. Fear turns us into prisoners. It keeps us locked and it keeps us isolated. And here are the disciples who've been with Jesus. They've seen some miraculous things. He's risen from the dead. They've been told about this by another friend of theirs. And they are in a house and they are locked in that house because they are scared. That people are going to be coming for them. That they are now going to become the target. They have fear that they are going to go through what Jesus has just gone through. They are scared of the Jews. They are locked up in a house. Prisoners to fear. Maybe for you it's the fear of death. It just comes and it just fills your mind to the point where you can't get anything else in your, in your thought process. And you become a prisoner in your own body because you are just consumed with this idea over and over and over again. And every time you have an ache or a pain in your body, you're convinced this is it. This is going to be what, what puts you under. Maybe for some it's the fear of the unknown. Go back to to when you're just starting school, the night before school was about to start. I wondered, who's, who's in my class? Am I going to know anybody? Am I going to have any friends? What's my teacher going to be like? Am I going to like this new school? Are people going to like me? What, what am I going to do? For some, it's the fear of flying. You refuse to climb into a death tube. You just absolutely refuse. You do not care that it will take you 14 days to drive from here to California and you could get there in four and a half hours with one layer. You're like, nope, not going to do it. We're going to drive. I am not climbing into one of them death tubes. For some people, there's a fear of driving. And when you've seen some other people drive, I understand that. But for some people, it's a fear of getting behind the wheel. Some people are frightened they're fright. They're, they're just so fearful of animals. Like, if I see a snake, I will scream louder and higher than anything you have ever heard in your entire life. All right? What did Satan use? A snake, okay? I, no, there is, some people are like, oh, Brian, you've got to understand. Snakes, they, 
what they do for the environment is incredible. And all of the rodents that they, they use for population control, and they are majestic creatures. Get your head examined. There is nothing good about a snake. There is no such thing as a good snake. Period. End of story. You will never convince me otherwise. And if you think, oh, we're going to have a little haha, we're going to have a little fun at Brian's expense, and we're going to prank him with a snake, you had better pray to the Lord I die, because I'm coming after you <laughs> if I don't. I don't play. I'm guilty. I hate snakes. They're awful. They're terrible. And they should be extinct. And if we ever have a little endangered list for a snake, so help me. Find me. Put me in jail. I don't care. But I'm killing everyone I see. So for some people, like myself, it's a fear of animals. Regardless of where you are on that spectrum, there might be something in your life, maybe multiple things, That can consume you. The thing about fear is that there are aspects of fear that are really good. Because it helps us preserve. And yet, just as with anything, we can go overboard and we can allow it to drive us. We can allow it to turn us into prisoners. And we can allow things that we should never fear to consume us. Jesus came and stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples are locked in a room. They're consumed by fear. They're afraid of what's going to happen to them. They're afraid of what the Jews are going to do them. Jesus shows up in the room through a locked door. And shows them his hands and his side. And he brings a message of peace. They are consumed by fear. Jesus provides them peace. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. I'm convinced this helped them. I'm convinced this helped them remember who Jesus is. And when you boil down a lot of the things that paralyze us, when you boil down a lot of the things that keep us prisoner to fear, the core is we forget who Jesus is. We forget who's in control. We forget that God's got this. We forget that there's a greater plan and a greater purpose than we can fathom. We forget that this life is not the end. It's merely the beginning. And we were never designed or created just to be physical beings. We forget that God is greater. We forget that God is in control. And Jesus shows up through a wall, through a door, looks at his disciples and offers them the promise of peace when they were stuck in their fear. And he says, oh, just remember, just remember something. This is who you're dealing with. This is how great I am. Look at my hands. Look at my side. I have defeated death. I am in control. I am God. And I'm offering you peace. When we forget who God is, and we lose sight of the fact that God is in control, we invite fear to come in and to reign in our lives. And every single time that we allow fear to come and to reign in our lives, it turns us into prisoners. have to remember who God is and that he's in control and he is greater than our circumstances he is greater than death he's just demonstrated that he's greater than the uncertainties and the unknowns because God knows everything and he's seen it all God is greater than anything this world can throw our way Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And he starts again with this offer of peace because he understands there is such a need. Even for these 
even for these men, his closest followers, who find themselves locked away in a room because they are prisoners of fear, he promises them peace because he understands the human condition. I want you to understand something. Today, Jesus is offering you the very same thing. He's offering you the promise of peace. He's offering you the freedom from fear. He's offering you the chance to really find rest which escapes when we're prisoners to fear. Peace be with you. Peace be yours. This was the promise of Jesus to his disciples and it's the promise of Jesus to us. And then he says, as the Father sent me, even so I am sending you. He's saying, you have a job to do. You have a job to do. And so you can't be a prisoner to fear. You can't let fear keep you isolated. You can't let fear keep you locked inside. You've got to bust out because you have a job to do. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Jesus was saying, you, in the same way that I'm offering you a change, in the same way that I'm offering you peace, you now need to go and be the change agents for the world. And you need to take this message to the world. Not that you be a prisoner to fear. No, you need to be the change agents that go and take the message of peace and hope and love to the whole world. God has sent me, the Father has sent me, and now I am sending you. So get out of your prison of fear. You discover peace, and it's got to start there because you can't go be a change agent. You can't change the world when you're locked inside yourself. And so you have to embrace this idea of peace. And some of you have so much potential to do so many incredible things for God, and God wants to do amazing things through you. He has given you you gifts to reach people. He's given you abilities that you can encourage so many people, and yet there's something that's holding you back, and you're just stuck, and you've allowed fear to hold you back, and you are in prison in and of yourself, and you have got to break free. You will never be the change agent that God has called you to be until you accept and embrace the peace that God has offered. And then Jesus talks to them about the Holy Spirit and about forgiveness. And then we're going to jump down. And now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So there were ten of the disciples. One had betrayed Jesus and killed himself. And Thomas was not there. But there were ten disciples who were locked in a room because they were afraid. Thomas wasn't there, so the other disciples told Thomas, we've seen the Lord. But Thomas said to them, unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. There's Thomas. He's not there. Jesus has appeared to the other disciples, and he's like, they're hallucinating, or they're just crazy. We've seen, we've heard what happened to Jesus. He's he's not there. These guys have lost it. They're delusional. He's he's a skeptic. That's healthy skepticism. He's like, I'm not not buying it. I, I don't know if it's grief talking. I don't know if it's delusion talking. I don't know what your guys' problem is. But unless I personally see it, and not just see it, because the eyes can be deceiving, unless I reach out and I touch it and feel it for myself, I'm, I'm not buying it. I don't believe it. And maybe you're there today. Maybe truth be told in your heart, 
there is a level of skepticism. You're just like, ah, you know, there's, there's some aspects of this idea of following Jesus that I like, but this is, come on. People are delusional. Gotta be out of their minds, all the things they believe. That's crazy. That makes sense. I want you to know if, if you're there today, a couple things. The first is this God is not scared off by your skepticism, God's not frightened by your doubt. And you're not too far gone to God, for God to reveal himself to you. There's one of his friends. There's one of his followers. Till I see it. Till I touch it. I don't believe it. You guys are nuts. You've lost it. You know what I love is Thomas demanded to see the very thing Jesus showed the others. When Jesus arrives on the scene and he says, Peace be with you, what's he do? He reaches out his hands. Here's Thomas, who wasn't at that scene, and he says, until I see it and until I touch it, I'm not going to believe it. Little did he know that is the very thing that Jesus had offered the other disciples. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Now, I don't know at this point if Jesus is just having fun with them. I don't know why he just keeps, like, flying through walls and doors. If I could, I probably would, too, just see the looks on people's faces. I don't, I don't, know, what, I don't know why he doesn't decide, hey, you know, I could knock. I, I don't know what's going on here, but he just he does it again. They're still behind locked doors. Do you get it? Jesus has shown up eight days earlier. He has said, peace be with you. He's commissioned them to go be the change agents of the world. He's talked to them about giving them the Holy Spirit. He's talked to them about forgiveness. And eight days later, here they are, back in a room, back behind locked doors. Never give up on somebody right after they make a decision to follow Jesus because they don't have it all together because their life doesn't look like the way you think their life should look like because they make some unfortunate choices Jesus has told them there is nothing to fear he has come through a locked door and a wall and appeared and he said here touch my hands look at them for yourself see and believe now go be the change agents for this world and be filled with peace and they are still a prisoner to their fear they are locked behind doors eight days later listen to me Those of you who are here and you are prisoners to your fear, I want you to understand something. God offers you peace, but in the process, know this, God is greater than your fear, and God can still work in and through you in your fear. God does not want you to stay there. But the greatest work that God wants to accomplish in you in and through you is you. He wants you to love him more and become more like him. 
That is the greatest work that God wants to accomplish in your life. Peace be with you. Then Jesus said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. And put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. And Jesus says, You want proof? Here it is. Reach out your finger and touch my hands. Touch my side. You struggling with doubt today? Ask God to reveal himself to you. Make sure your heart's right in that. Right? Don't say, Lord, I'm I'm struggling to believe. So God, I will trust you and I will believe in you if you could anonymously wire a hundred million dollars into my bank account. By 5 p.m. today on a non-banking day. (laughs) To prove that you really are all-powerful. Amen. You aren't getting that hundred million. And if you are, you had better tithe. (laughs) But it's not going to happen. Because your motives aren't right. But if you humbly and honestly will approach God with your doubt and ask Him to reveal Himself to you, rest assured He will. God is not scared by your doubt. He encounters it head on with Thomas. He says, here you go. Here are my hands. Here's my side. Thomas answered him, my Lord, my God. Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Blessed are those who haven't seen and yet have believed. And everywhere we go, we see the invisible qualities of God on display, and yet we don't have the luxury. of seeing God in the way that Thomas did. In the way the disciples did. And on one level, do I wish that we could look out and see? Absolutely. And yet, on the other hand, it's so obvious when you look around and you see the way that things are really designed, you see there has to be There has to be a plan that is greater than what I can fathom. There has to be a plan that is greater than what I can understand. And not only that, let's go back eight days earlier to a room where the followers of Jesus are locked. Because of fear. 
Jesus shows up with an offer and a promise of peace and a call for them to go be the change agents for the world. People can't see God. They can see His qualities. They can't see Him. What they can see is us. So let's make sure we're the change agents that God has called us to be. That we allow peace and hope and love to rule and reign in our hearts, in our lives, and then we take that and we change this world. Because we choose peace. Because we choose hope. And because we choose love. God, I pray that you would help us not be prisoners of fear. Help us remember who's in charge. Who's in control. I pray for the person here, God, who's skeptical struggling with doubt and I pray that you would reveal yourself to them in a very real intangible way God that you would help them know you are not scared off by their doubt But when they see you reveal yourself to them, that they would have the same response of Thomas. And they would just say, my Lord and my God. And they would truly surrender their lives to you. God, I pray that we as Lakeside, collectively and individually, we would choose peace. We would choose hope. And we would choose love. Let all who see it.